Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sanctuary that you give us in this place, uh, a place of quiet and comfort and a solitude, opportunity to focus into something that matters so much and something you've prepared for us to understand from, from thousands of years ago. And yet, Father, the events of what we learn in this book is, is so relevant, so real, so timely. What a privilege it must uh, be, Father, for each of us to be at this stage of history, even if we aren't in a position to fully appreciate it yet. And Lord, we ask that you'd uh, make us equal uh, to that privilege, to that opportunity, that we would take what we're given and we would be ready to use it as, as much as can be in the days that we have so that we're ready to be your witness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Well, welcome back to our study of Revelation. We're continuing to roll through the letters to the churches. Uh, last week, I told you as the, at the outset we were going to do a lot, and you handled it pretty well. And because you handled it so well, well, let me just show you what it's going to be like tonight. <laughs> All right, so let's go. We got a lot to do. Uh, we are examining the letters in, in the first two chapters of, or first three chapters of Revelation from a historical, universal, and prophetic point of view. And if you haven't been here before tonight, I would encourage you to go back and listen to what you've missed. It's all available online, and I can't obviously spend time tonight to uh, uh, bring everyone up to speed. So we just pull forward from where we left off. And that is that we're going to understand these letters as they were written, which is first to a very specific audience in a specific time. Secondly, we're going to understand these letters as written universally in that there are aspects of what happens in these churches that are going to be true for the church throughout its existence in various places. Then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we look at the letter from a prophetic point of view, which is that the, these letters reveal the nature of the church as it exists over time. This goes back to what Jesus gave us in the outline in which he said to John, write the things that you have seen, which is chapter 1. Then he said, write the things which are, which are these letters in chapters 2 and 3. And once we understand that these letters are prophetically a representation of the church period on earth, then we begin to understand why he said they are the times that are. Because for as long as the church is around on earth to read these letters, just as we are now, then by definition, the times are still are. The church is still here. The church is still around. So the church is the second point in the outline. It connects the moment of John's revelation in chapter 1 to what will happen afterward in chapters 4 and onward. So this is the chart we've been using to explore the prophetic view of the letters that is to make sense of how these letters each represent a period of history. And we've looked through the first four so far. We've reached up to the letter of Thyatira. I'm not going to review all of those. They're on the chart, but you can certainly go back and look at past teaching. But now with that, let's march onward into the history of the church, moving now to the next letter, which is Sardis. This goes to chapter 3, verse 1, the letter to the church of Sardis. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, you guys have seen the pattern now on the first four letters, so we should have a pretty good uh, feeling for what we do and how we do this, right? The structure of the letters guides us through our understanding. And we begin, as always, with the name. The name of this church is Sardis, and it's a bit of a difficult one to track down entomologically, that is, it's not easy to understand the, the origin of the name. There are those who have proposed that it means the escaping ones. Others have proposed it means remnant. We're going to let that stand as, as it is. 
It's a city in John's day from Asia Minor. It was a capital of a province called Lydia. It was about 60 miles northeast of Smyrna, which we studied earlier. And it was an important commercial center. Uh, among the many things the city had a claim to fame for, it was that it said to be the place where they first discovered how to dye wool into different colors. And it had massive temples, had really fertile soil, volcanic soil made it very productive. And the city today is in ruins in Turkey, as many of these cities are, but in its day it was a strong city, a very fortified city. The ancient city was built on a mountain. It was protected by a virtually impregnable watchtower and triple depth walls all the way around it. And there had been a lot of times over history when attackers had tried to take the city. Not many had succeeded. And there's a legend associated with Sardis as it relates to that impregnability of an army one time that came and uh, sieged the city, was trying to take it captive. And a local slave in the city noticed that one of the guard officers up on the towers, up on the walls of the city, had lost his helmet over the wall. It went rolling down the hillside. And thinking the helmet was lost, the slave uh, was surprised later to see that same soldier emerging out from the, the side of the hill and come out, retrieve his helmet, go back up into the side of the hill, disappear, and then a few moments later reappear up on top of the wall with his helmet. And that told the slave that there must have been some kind of secret entrance into the city that was only known by the residents of the city. So in 214 BC, Antiochus the Great lay siege to the city and that particular slave was captured at a point in the battle and the slave offered to tell the invading army about this secret entrance in exchange for his own safety. And sure enough, that's how Antiochus conquered the city through that secret entrance, like a thief in the night. Uh, turning to the letter itself, the description of Christ to the city he opens with a piece of the larger description from chapter 1, like he's done with each letter. In this case, he assigns this city the part of his description that is the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, or as we know, seven angels. The emphasis here is on seven again. That is, on the whole of the spirit, on the angels of the church, all of the church. It's communicating that Sardis is an authentic church. It's a true church. It has the spirit of God, though it is also a weak church and in one regard more than any other. Sardis, he says, I know your deeds, and then he says, it is to say, I know you don't have any. That's what he just said. That is, he says, you have a name, you are alive, but in terms of deeds, you're dead. That's the commentary on Sardis. Sardis has fallen victim to one of the warnings that you know well from the book of James, in which he says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? That's the nature of the faith that existed in Sardis. We are saved by our faith alone, but our faith without accompanying works is useless, that is, useless to God. It does nothing for God that we don't serve Him in our works. Our faith has become useless to the author and perfecter of our faith if we do not put it to work. And Jesus says that to this church. He says, faith, James goes on to say, faith by itself, which is to say, faith without the accompanying works, is dead. And that's how Jesus means it when he says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're actually dead. That is, faith without works is a dead kind of faith. It's a still a saving faith, but it's a useless one. And Jesus tells this church, because they have this name of Christ, which is to say, because they are his, and yet because they don't have works, because they are dead in their, in their behavior, they have a problem that they need to solve. Because faith being a gift from God to every believer is intended to produce glory for the one who gave it. And the way you're supposed to fulfill that purpose of giving glory to the Father, as Jesus says, is shine your light before men such that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When you lack works, well, your faith is still there. You're just not fulfilling its purpose. You're not doing what you're supposed to do with it. Ephesians 2.10, Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. You know, there's not an option here. <laughs> it's not up to you or me. That's why he says he has not found, and notice the phrase, he says, your deeds have not been found complete. Notice in whose sight? In the Father's sight, that is in the sight of my God, which is Jesus' way of referring to the Father at times. They have not fulfilled the purpose that the Father had in assigning the faith that he gave. 
which also tells us that the Father alone is the judge of whether or not our service meets his expectations. All right, so this church has this problem. How do we characterize this problem? I would characterize it this way. They have become comfortable with faith alone. Comfortable in faith alone. Possessing salvation, but with very little interest in spreading it to others. They are an example of a church with creeds, but no deeds. And churches can reach the point where doctrine and belief exists for its own sake. You begin to think that you're merely standing for the truth, believing the truth, teaching the truth, that that's enough. Just being a, a, a beacon of truth, that's enough. Those things are necessary, yes. Those things are not sufficient to please Christ, however. The Christian walk is supposed to be as much practice as it is theory. And believers are supposed to care about the truth, yes, about getting the Bible right, yes, but if your faith remains an intellectual pursuit, you are doing nothing for the glory of Christ. And that's the concern he has with this church. Possession of the truth without action becomes cause for convicting us rather than for praising us. Having the truth all by itself and doing nothing with it is a source of conviction. So the Sardis type of church, if you look at the two together with the previous one, Thyatira, it's actually the opposite of Thyatira. They live on opposite ends of a spectrum. In Thyatira, you had this church that had many great impressive works, and in fact, Jesus says your works are growing, you're reaching more people, you're doing more things. But their works, if you remember, were divorced from the truth of Scripture so that they lack spiritual power. So you know, the whole idea of doing works in the first place, physical works of service in any respect, the whole point of that is for opportunities to share the gospel, you know, to make inroads through relationships so that you can minister not just to the body, but to the spirit as well with the truth that you have to offer. Instead, what Thyatira was doing was simply trapping people into a system of religion that polluted their soul with heresy and demonic teaching, and their works then were actually doing no good for the kingdom in that regard. They had works, they didn't have the truth. Now you got a church holding to the truth of the faith and yet failing to put that truth to work for the benefit of others. So in Sardis, the truth is disconnected from any outward appearance of love of Jesus, which is going to limit the reach of the gospel. I mean, it's probably no surprise when I tell you this, but people are not terribly attracted to a bunch of know-it-all Christians who don't do anything to lift a finger to help them. <laughs> That's not an attractive uh, value proposition to the, to the world. So Thyatira... Put it simply, used works to justify heresy. Sardis was using truth to justify laziness. That's the, the two sides of the spectrum you have with these two churches. So what's Jesus say to Th Sardis? He says, I want you to wake up and I want you to strengthen what remains. Now to wake up in this sense means to come out of this stupor of ignorance and apathy and, and rediscover the mission of the church. Strengthen what remains suggests that some of this church still had a heart for the mission. And so he says, you got a remnant in there that knows what this is all about. Take that, build on it, magnify it. And then he says, if you don't, it's going to die out. And there is a fundamental truth of church life at work in what he just said. And you see it all around you, by the way, even today. Churches serve themselves, and if they do, when they do, when they only care about what's said inside the building, then they lose their reason to exist, and they eventually die out. While churches that take the message outside the walls, they will seek to share what they have, and that tends to promote growth. I mean, it's just a fundamental truth of, of Christian life. So the irony is you can have everything pretty wrapped up tight and on target and exactly where it needs to be and truth exactly right every time inside a building, and if it never leaves the walls, who cares? Exactly what did that do anybody? So the church has to have a mentality that says what we have in here is what we want to share outside. We build up in here to go out and use it with the world. And it's Jesus' desire that we do that. And without that desire, the future of that church is in doubt, and justifiably so, because we don't need more of that. And then Jesus gives them the recipe for finding strength. I love this recipe, this, this solution. It's so simple. He says, remember what you received and heard. But think about what he means. At a church, uh, as a church, Sardis was probably still young enough as a church to remember the day that faith first took hold in that city. Remember what they received, he says. Remember how it came to you. They were saved in Sardis because some apostle walked into that city against whatever persecution might have been coming 
and preached the gospel and did some kind of works and supported the church in some fashion. And at that moment, when that gospel arrived, there was a moment of joy for the city. It, it marked God's forgiveness ar arriving for the people in that city. It transformed the whole life of, of those that came to faith in that city. Surely they remember that. The kindness, the, the, the sacrifice of the apostle, what it must have felt like. Can you remember that, what it felt like to first grasp the good news, to the, the release of guilt, the, the, the release of burden, the understanding that this is actually something for me and I can, I can look forward to an eternity with Christ and it's already done on the cross, there's nothing more to do. You remember that, if you can, when you were in, perhaps an adult? Jesus says, if you can remember that, why would you not want someone else to experience that? Why would you want to deny that from someone else? Not that you control it, but the point is, why would you withhold that experience? Someone else brought it to you. You're thankful they did. What are you doing about it next? Right? That's the attitude he wants that person to have. Remember what you received and how you heard it. And if you do that, then you'll have the motivation to go out. If you fail to wake up, Jesus says, then he will be like a thief coming into their stronghold. And the analogy is a really powerful one. A thief in the night. You know, a thief in the night does his work when you're asleep, which is the whole point of wake up. You're sleeping, and by the time you do wake up, what do you wake up to find? Everything you valued is gone. And so it would be for this church. They would find themselves an empty house if they didn't wake up to the mission of the church, which is fundamentally accomplished through deeds. The message is not one of deeds, but the work of the church for those who believed is that of deeds. And the Spirit, in this case, was going to take the mission somewhere else, leaving behind an empty shell, an empty cathedral, an empty choir loft, an empty bunch of creeds, if the church wasn't willing to act on them. And then lastly, he gives that little encouragement at the end of Sardis, like he does with all these churches, so that those who are believing in the church don't misunderstand. The, the warnings are not to concern them individually. This is not about individual salvation. He says in verse 4, There are some who have not soiled their garments, for they walk in white and are worthy. Now there's some interesting imagery at the end of this letter that we need to spend a few minutes on. It will actually clarify things we'll study later in this same book. The white garment. A white garment in the Bible is a picture of salvation. And you can see that clearly in verse 5. In this same letter, where I said before, symbols are often defined in their own context. In verse 5 he says, Those who overcome, which we know from 1 John is a terminology for the believer. Those who overcome, he says, are those who wear white, or we would say pure, garments. So the white garment is a picture of those who are saved. And we know that from elsewhere too. Paul says in Galatians 6, or sorry, 3, 27, he says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The idea here is simple, that our atonement is given to us by the blood of Christ. We are washed in the blood of Christ. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ by our faith. All right, so clothes have that symbology. Now conversely, the Bible keeps that metaphor going one step further when it talks about an unbeliever. An unbeliever is someone who is what? If you tell me soiled, you're wrong. It's who has no garment. Those who are naked, lacking the clothing. That is the picture of those who do not have the atonement of Christ. They have not put on Christ. They have not been covered. Their sin has not been covered. Their shame in their nakedness is still exposed, so to speak. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, he speaks about our body as a house, and he says, For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we have putting it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. To be naked, metaphorically, means to be exposed, have our sin exposed to God. To be clothed means to have it covered by the righteousness of God. Of Christ. Okay? So, white garments represent the covering you receive when you believe, while a nakedness is the picture of someone who has not believed. So, what does it mean when he says, few, uh, there are a few in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their white garments? Well, in this context, they have garments, they're clothed, they're not naked, so they're clearly believers. But what does it mean that they've soiled that garment? Well, it would have to mean that the testimony of that believer has been negatively impacted. Remember, this person having been clothed 
they've already received salvation, the soiling there must be how they are seen. That is to say, uh, Jesus says in verse four, they are worthy to walk with me if they have not soiled their garments. Or another way to say it is that they are walking well with him. So the condition of the garment speaks to the condition of your witness, to how you appear as a Christian. We get confirmation of this interpretation later in the book. So the immediate context drives us there, and a later context in this book gives us confirmation. In Revelation 19, verse 7, we read this. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Christ, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Who's the bride of Christ? The church. Going on, it says, And it was given to her, the bride of Christ, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. So, in other words, Revelation 19 says that a garment that is bright and clean represents righteous acts of the saints. And conversely, a soiled garment represents the lack thereof. So in this case, he says, Sardis has a few who have not soiled their, their garments, which is to say there's only a few that have a testimony of righteous acts in that church. The vast majority of which have soiled their life their garments, by not living up to what is expected. Now, please don't let the imagery confuse you. We're not talking about salvation here whatsoever, either way. They got a garment, they're in heaven. End of story. But you don't want to go in looking dirty. You want to go in looking cleaner. All right? And then Jesus ends reminding the church that no matter what penalty the Lord may visit upon his church, the individual believer is secure. He says those who have overcome, he will not erase their names from the book of life, and he will confess them before his Father who is in heaven. Now, that phrase, I will not erase your name from the book of life, right, causes confusion and some concerns for some people, lots of discussion about that. Um, it, like many contra controversies, it's really just the lack of appreciation of, of the original text. The book of life, let's start there. The book of life is the Bible's term for the heavenly role in which is recorded the names of every human being who is saved. And the Bible uses this term in several places in the New Testament and as well in Psalms. Elsewhere in this book, in Revelation, we're told that the Lord has recorded the names of those saved in this book from before the foundations of the earth. What that tells me is that the contents of that book are not determined by events that take place on the earth because the book and its contents were set before there was an earth. So by definition, it's set, then the earth comes along. You can't say anything on the earth brought it to pass. It, it existed before the earth did. So the list is done, it's in the book, it's been there since before anybody was alive. But now you, hear, you have Jesus talking about erasing. And that psalm I mentioned uh, a moment ago, there's a Psalm 69 says that the righteous are recorded in the book meaning believers, but then the psalmist goes on to say, God, please blot out the names of the unrighteous from your book. Well, then that brings this question back into the foreground. Well, does that mean they're in there first and then he can erase them? All right, well, how do you understand these two comments? Well, here's the short answer. First of all, no, names are not taken out of the book. No, names are not erased from the book. And to understand why that's true here, you have to have a better sense of Jewish writing. Poetically speaking, it is a common technique in Jewish writing to emphasize a certain truth by negating its opposite. You emphasize a truth by negating the opposite. It's a poetic style, okay? So in the psalm, the writer says, the unrighteous should be blotted out of the book. That's a way of saying they will not be found in the book. You affirm something by negating the opposite. Similarly, Jesus says, a believer will always be found in the book of life by saying, I will not erase your name. He's not saying he might or that it was even a possibility. He's just affirming you will be there because I'm telling you I'm not going to erase your name. So in Jewish writing, it's a style. I affirm something by negating its opposite. Don't let that lead you to think that the opposite was ever a possibility. Okay. So what is the prophetic interpretation of this church period. Where in history are we? Well, we know this follows Thyatira. So Thyatira is the period of the church age that we said corresponds to the Roman Catholic Church. 
And as such, historically, it's not hard to guess where we're going because what put an end to the hegemony of the Catholic Church was the Reformation and the rise of Protestantism. The name kind of clues us in on that because, as I said, it's been proposed to mean escaping or perhaps remnant, as in a group escaping out of apostasy, uh, a remnant coming out of a heretical institution, and the spirit itself shifting from one institution to a new institution. All right? And that's why he starts the letter by saying, the seven spirits talk to Sardis. It's a way of saying, here's the church with the spirit at that stage of history, or another way to say it is, the spirit of God, starting in 1517, was no longer abiding in the Catholic Church. It was now abiding in a new institution in place of that. It had moved on as Christ said it would. So the Reformation was the true church at that point. And it's easy to see why. It brought a recommitment to biblical truth. It brought back proper doctrine according to scripture. Most importantly, it brought back the true gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The, solo, the, the, the solos of the Reformation, right? And during this movement, most of the worst heresies of the Catholic Church were eliminated as part of the Reformation, although they did retain some practices simply out of tradition. Clergy, laity distinctions, infant baptisms, among others. Uh, those were traditions that stuck from the Catholic Church, even though they were not biblical. But one of the often overlooked consequences of the Reformation was the one that Jesus cared the most about, it appears. And that is the abandonment of evangelism and the diminished emphasis on works of charity. And this might be a surprise to you. you may, if you've never studied the Reformation, you might have assumed that was just such a wonderful period of church revival and there's nothing negative about it. But that's not exactly true. And I think it's perhaps because Catholicism preached a salvation by works gospel and they used social works of various kinds, you know, schools, hospitals, and the like, as a means of promulgating that false gospel. Because that had been the history, it would appear as though the reformers took an opposite approach. That is to say, they emphasized God's sovereignty and they emphasized biblical doctrines, but they did so at the expense of seeking the lost and encouraging personal works in faith. In fact, you know how bad it got? Martin Luther was so put off by talk of good works that he doubted the inspired credentials of the letter of James. And when he translated the Bible into German, he put the letter of James in an appendix. He took it out of the New Testament canon because he had so little doubt or so little confidence in its inspired source. Because James said, faith without works is dead, and Catholics had used that to defend their bad theology. They had misinterpreted it. But then Luther went the other way and said, works should not be part of the conversation when it comes to Christianity. So out of the Reformation, you get this culture that's alive, but in name only. They have reflexively turned against Catholicism's emphasis on good works. And when a church stops preaching the importance of serving Christ in good works, do you know what you get? Lazy Christians. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy for a Christian to find motivation to work when their own theology is telling them it doesn't matter. And so we just don't care. We produce believers with soiled garments, so to speak. They have not completed their works in the Father's eyes. So, did the judgment that Jesus promised to this church come to pass? Did they wake up or did the thief come? Well, for the first 100 years after the Reformation, you see the church dominated by a handful of state churches. This is part of the history that really helps you understand what Christ is so upset about. You had Lutherans in Germany, you had Anglicans in England, you had Presbyterians in Scotland, and so on. Catholics were still in France. So in these early stages of the Reformation, you still had a state church in each area. They just started to change in terms of which religion went with which state. In 1648, about 100 years after the Reformation, the, you had the Thirty Years' War end, and that was the war between Protestants and Catholics, and it was ended with something called the Peace of Westphalia. And that treaty established, among other things, the modern basis of Europe. And the Peace of Westphalia also required that every citizen of the respective countries had the right to practice Christianity in any form they wanted. They no longer had to practice it according to the state religion. Because before that moment, if you were born in Germany, you were a Lutheran. You were so much a Lutheran, you were baptized as a Lutheran as an infant, and you could not change the rest of your life. The government took your tithe automatically out of your paycheck, 
and sent it to the state church. That still happens today in Germany. If you declare yourself a Lutheran, the government takes your tithe out of your taxes and gives it to the state church. So you were the religion of the state. How many of those babies in, in Germany do you think were truly Christian? The same problem we had with the Catholic church, just now under another title in, in that sense. So among the many tenets of the Peace of Westphalia, it said no longer does someone have to stay in the state religion if they don't want to. And it protected Christian expression in greater forms. And as a result, Protestant faiths began to emerge in many different stripes. The works of faith were reignited in a new generation of Reformed churches birthed out of the Peace of Westphalia, which now woke up to challenge the historic power of those state churches. And where you see the Reformed churches still asleep, they have slowly died out. Go look at a cathedral in Western Europe today and see what's left in it. But where these newer versions of Protestantism pro cropped up, the Pilgrims, the Anabaptists, and so on, they became a new movement, and that new movement went out from Europe to the rest of the world. God, as he, uh, Jesus, as he promised, said, wake up, make use of what's left, or you're going to have the thief come and take what you have, which is exactly what happened to mainline Protestantism in Western Europe. And that's what gives rise to the next church. So this church, I date as ending with the peace of Westphalia because of that significance for how it changed the nature of, of Christianity in general in Western Europe and therefore in the world at large. And then we move forward there to the next church, Philadelphia. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my name. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Philadelphia, one guess what that name means. Everyone knows that, right? Brotherly love. Um, the city was founded by the king of Pergamum. Attalus II, uh, his name was, full name was Attalus II, Philadelphus of Pergamum. And he was given the title Philadelphus because his love for his brother was so renowned, and his brother was the prior king, and so he came to be known as that. And Philadelphia was named after him. It's present-day uh, present Alashir in Turkey. I, at the time, it was small, not a very big town, not nearly as, uh, pros or as uh, prominent as the ones we've studied up till now. Uh, but it was prosperous, but it had a major disadvantage. Living in Philadelphia had one big problem. Uh, it had earthqu earthquakes, frequent earthquakes, and there are commonly earthquakes throughout Turkey, but Philadelphia seemed to get its fair share. And in 17 AD, there was a quake so strong in the city that so many of the buildings fell down that the people who were living there were so afraid of going back in and being crushed by falling Greek columns that they started living outside. And for a long period of time, people were living outside in the city of Philadelphia. That pattern of kind of working your way to get back into a building and feel trusting again, and then the next earthquake, and then people are out in the, you know, outside again, that really hampered the growth of the city. People really didn't like living there. So it was a small town. But it also bred a culture of determination and persistence. And that seems to have found its way into the church. Looking at the letter, to this church he says, I'm the one who is holy and true, and I'm the one who has the key of David. Those references remind the church of some basic things. The centrality of Jesus to the mission and the message of the church, and that when you carry Jesus before you in the work, then he can open any door. Very simple, right? The key of David is an interesting reference. If you did the Ezekiel study with me, you may know what this refers to. But in the book of Ezekiel, when we hear about how the kingdom temple will be built, we hear that David will be resurrected, he will be there, and he has a job. And his job, among other things, is to preside over the court of the temple and have the key to it. And the temple will be open. The courts will be open throughout the uh, millennial reign. 
except for one door. And uh, the point is, if Jesus has the key to the temple, he is the key of David. In other words, he's making clear, I have the one, I am the one to grant access to my temple in the kingdom. And key, amongst, uh, key in that, or particularly in that thought, is the mercy seat. You know, the mercy seat in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, that's the place where atonement is taken, and atonement is done. That's where forgiveness is found. That's where the place that God, uh, God applies Jesus' blood in the heavenly tabernacle. And so it becomes a picture of salvation itself. If you can go into the temple, that is to say you can go before the Lord, you can receive forgiveness. It's a very uh, kind of deep way of saying, I've got the key to salvation. I've got the key to salvation. And if I open it, nobody closes it, and vice versa. So as with everything else we've seen in this letter, he is showing I'm in control of the gospel. I'm in control of where it's going, where it's received, where it's not going to be received. And so to say the door is open to any church is an encouragement to know that if you have a heart to reach the lost, you're on the right side. You've got one working with you that is through you who can ensure that your endeavors will pay off. Knowing Jesus is in the business of saving souls means that you can go out boldly and you don't have to have any concern over your success or failure. You weren't in charge of that in the first place. And as such, then the result is entirely in Jesus' hands. How can you lose? You're not going to save anyone that he didn't want to save, and anyone that you don't infect was not someone he wanted to save through you on that day. So you just keep going. It doesn't really matter what happens. You're, you're, you're not going to reflect on the answer and decide, I'm doing something wrong here. I don't know what I'm doing. I should stop. I don't seem to have any... No, no. There's a little too much I in that. A lot too much. Because Jesus also closes doors at times, which means there will be moments, there will be circumstances, there will be individuals, there may even be seasons when your efforts just don't produce. And that too is a decision of the one with the key of David. And knowing this, knowing that he opens and that he closes is a critically important detail to staying motivated. Yeah, the opening part, that makes you motivated, but the closing part, that should motivate you too. And the reason I say that is because if you know that your failure is not a reflection on you, it is simply that God has not chosen to do something through your effort on that day, you can walk free from that moment, not feel any guilt, and not be afraid that you're not doing it right. Just keep going. Right? Like they say, even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. Right? You don't have to think about your own abilities. It's not up to you. If you can speak through a donkey, you know, he's not dependent on us. But that's not meant to diminish your interest. It's meant to encourage you because it takes away any reason not to try. That's the idea. He's trying to reinforce for this church, your works are, are done in my sovereignty and power, go forward. Now historically, the church in Philadelphia was a small church, in keeping with the fact that it was not a very big city. But they apparently were a pretty strong, faithful little bunch. And perhaps it was the threat of death and the uncertainty of disaster, it just created a good environment where you could teach about the rock of Jesus, or about the fact that if you die tomorrow, this is what could happen to you. Maybe that's part of it. Um, I'm sure that environment would have opened up some opportunities for the gospel. But in that way, the church becomes a model church when it comes to evangelism. Philadelphia is the church of the seven that you look at if you want the model for what Jesus wants to see in his church when it comes to evangelism. They worked in ways that Sardis did not. Serving people and sharing the news of Jesus. But equally important, notice Philadelphia was careful to take note of where Jesus was not working. He says in verse 8, they have a little power, which is to say they recognize that apart from Jesus they could do nothing. They weren't unrealistic. They understood that they're going to get what done, whatever Jesus wants them to get done. They're not trying to work in their own power. They're just trying to abide in him. Let the chips fall where they may. And as a result of that, and this is what's important to remember, though they are the smallest church, they're in the least prominent city, this is one of only two churches that receives no condemnation. The other one being Smyrna. So Smyrna and Philadelphia both pleased Jesus to the point where he could think of nothing negative to say to them. Smyrna, you may, rem may remember, was the church that was faithful to death. That is, they were the church suffering persecution. And Philadelphia is the one that is faithful to the mission. So Smyrna is faithful in their witness to death, and so in their person, in their, in their identity, they're faithful. And Philadelphia is faithful in their work to the world. Identity and work, two examples. Sure does seem like Jesus is concerned with how well our lives might witness to him, doesn't he? 
That seems to be a big issue for him. And interestingly, these two churches share one other thing in common. They're both persecuted churches. This church, like the other one, has the same group of synagogue of Satan mentioned. These are the two letters that mention the synagogue of Satan. So both are being attacked by Jews who persecute the church. And friends, it is no coincidence that the two churches in this list with the strongest witness are also the two churches on this list that are persecuted. When you stand out for the gospel and for Jesus, you will be persecuted, Jesus said. And when you are persecuted, it refines you. It purifies you. It tests and approves you. And as a result, you get equipped to serve Jesus even more. And that's why Jesus tells us in the Gospels, Rejoice when you are persecuted for my name's sake, because your reward in heaven will be great. Notice in verse 9, he says that though they are being attacked, he will defend them. But now, let me ask you, before you had read the letter and I said to you that Jesus was prepared to defend this faithful church from persecution and attack, what would you have imagined that defense might have looked like? Perhaps you imagine Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, that end scene, you know, where the Spirit of God comes forth to vanquish the bad guys by melting their faces. Right? Some kind of blast, and they're all done, right? Well, the Lord's ways are not Hollywood's ways. And if you look at what he says in this letter, he says in verse 9, those that persecute the church were going to come and bow down before them and know that Jesus loved the church. In other words, he converts them. Those who will be persecuting, like Saul turning into Paul, those who persecuted Jesus, the Jews, in fact, uh, of his day, and I'm sorry, of this day, Philadelphia's day, would become believers as a result of Philadelphia's preaching, which would mean their witness in the persecution itself became cause for God to turn the hearts of the persecutors. What a great testimony. The point here is, when the church has a heart to reach out, you will see fruit in those situations, even if they are persecution. Whatever comes of it, God will turn it to something good. That's why he's put us on the earth. And as a result of their faithfulness, he promises that they will be preserved from an hour of testing. Now, we believe, based historically now, looking back in the first century, that this hour of testing may have been an allusion to the coming persecution in the last part, the end of the first century, early second century, which would have been Domitian uh, beginning to persecute the church in the Roman Empire. And so he's saying, and we must conclude, that the church in Philadelphia was either too small, out of the way, or whatever, that it just did not experience much, if any, of that persecution in keeping with what Christ said he would do for them. But then you notice he says in there that this hour affects, verse 10, affects all who dwell on the earth. All right, now that is one of the clearest references you will find in the seven letters to alert you to the prophetic nature of these letters. That is to say, this is the phrase that tells us you're supposed to look at these letters as picturing periods of history, not merely talking about things of the first century. Because we know there was no worldwide testing of the population of the earth in the first century. There was no event that we know of that meets that definition. So it must be a future event. In other words, an event that takes place after the Church of Philadelphia doesn't even exist. So then it's not speaking strictly about that location. And it was this comment, particularly in this letter, that first gave scholars an indication that there was a hidden prophetic meaning intended in these letters. And then upon further examination, it became clearer in the last century. So we do know the Bible describes a coming worldwide testing that will come upon all who dwell on the earth. And after we finish these letters, that's where we're going next in some of our study. Meanwhile, he ends his letter with a promise. He says, I'm going to come quickly, so hold fast to your gains. Don't let anyone take your crown. And you remember now what crowns refer to from prior weeks, right? The crowns are those things that we hear in the scripture representing your eternal reward. So this is speaking about the reward that they've earned through a life of faithful service to Christ and a reward they receive in the kingdom. Now, is it interesting, though, that he says, don't let anyone take it? How could someone take your crown? Well, what he's reminding them of is the fact that you don't get a prize until you run to the end of the race. You know, if it's a four-lap race and you quit after lap three, no prize. You might have been in first place when you quit, no prize. You might have been a lap ahead of it, no prize. You don't get a prize till you finish. And that's Paul's argument in Scripture. He says the one who wins the race is the one who runs to the end. It's a way of saying what you did yesterday, good, but what you do tomorrow still matters. You might be 60, you might be 90, you're not done working for Christ. And if you're 80 and you haven't started, it's a good thing you're still alive. 
I mean, not looking behind, but looking ahead, right? Run for the prize, Paul says. John says this, 2 John 8, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Very strong warning that a life ended poorly can subtract in some sense from a life that began well. No, no time to give up. Let's, let's run the race. Finally, the inevitable encouragement, he says, their eternal future is unshakable, using a beautiful picture that they know well from that city. He says, you're going to be able to enter a temple. Think of a place now with high ceilings built on top of tall columns, something they would have been used to in their Roman and Greek city. And you're going to be able to go in there, he says, and you're never going to have to leave. Remember why they leave now? Because every time there's a little shaking on the earth, everything starts falling down. And he tells them, you're not going to have that problem in the kingdom. You'll be able to come into the temple and never, never worry about running out. A further confirmation, your faith and its future is secure. Nothing that might happen in this city changes that. All right, so what period of church history does this letter represent? We have Philadelphia. We know it's the church that comes after the Reformation. It's a little uh, harder here to sort of put some timelines around that way. I'm using the, the piece of Westphalia as my uh, starting point, because as I said, in those years after the Reformation, when there was virtually no mission work being done, I mean, after all, think about it from the reformers' point of view. Everyone who was born in Germany is a Lutheran. Who's left to go evangelize? What's missions when everybody is something? Now, we know that that doesn't mean somebody's a believer just because somebody stamped them with a label at two, at two days old, right? But not, that's not how the church thought. That's where you get this misconception that sprinkling a baby is saving somebody. It's this idea that because I've gone through the ritual, it automatically commits God to the substance. And that, that's just not the way the Bible talks. It's not true. It's merely ritual unless it's accompanied by true faith in the heart of the individual. So with that mindset, mission work went away. There's virtually no mission work for 100 years. People were just born into the church, and perhaps some came to faith, obviously, and some didn't. But as that was set free, and as you get all these splinter groups moving out, now you have this burst of activity around the world. Pilgrims, Anabaptists, and all the rest. And the New World was a big target. Men like Jonathan Edwards began the Great Awakening on the North American continent. Missionaries reached Central and South America for the very first time. Australia for the first time. Asia became a focus. And in the span of about 300 years after the Peace of Westphalia, there was more spread of the gospel into more parts of the world faster than at any time since the first century. It was like, a, it was like going back in time 1,600, 1,700 years to see the movement of the church that way. And what's really interesting, it was also the first time Jewish people were evangelized since the first century. And it resulted in Jews coming to faith in various pockets of the world, in keeping with the promise that Jesus made to this church that they would bow down before you. And though the church was weak, that is to say, the churches that came out of the Peace of Westphalia were not state churches. They were not funded by automatic tithes coming out of citizens' paychecks. They were weak and small in comparison. Yet, they had a stupendous effect on the movement of the church. For the time, Philadelphia reestablished the true outward witnessing church that Jesus has always intended that his church would be. And it had a great impact as a result. So, in prophetic terms, he says, this church will not be the church that experiences the hour of testing that goes to the whole of the earth. So, prophetically now, what that means is that it will not be the last period of the church age. That, that is to say, the age of the church will not finish with Philadelphia. There, it, there will be one more after it before we reach the end. Philadelphia will not have to experience it, so to speak. So we say Philadelphia is the missionary church, and the end date is a bit speculative, but as we go into the last letter now, you'll understand why we picked that date. All right, so we still have a bit to do. It's 10 minutes till. Just remember how I started the slides today, and you'll know why we're not done yet. Verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write... The Amen, the faithful and true, uh, a faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and your eyes have to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and, came and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The name Laodicea means people ruling or judgment of the people. And this city was a commercial center, prosperous city, administrative center. It was probably the richest city in the district. And when the city was destroyed in 60 AD by an earthquake, it, it was so rich it didn't need any help from the emperor to rebuild. And that may not sound like much, but that was unprecedented. Cities just didn't have those kinds of resources in that day. And yet they did. But it also came from their self-sufficient culture. This was a city that did not like to have to lean on anyone. They had a bit of a chip on their shoulder. They had their act together. They had all the money they needed. They didn't want to be dependent on anyone. And among its many industries, three of them stand out historically, and they have relevance in the letter. They were known for banks, linen, and a woolen industry, a woolen and linen, and a medical school. So bank, medical school, and this woolen industry. The banks held all the money. You know, whoever has the money wins, right? So they had all the money in the district. Uh, the woolen industry produced some of the finest wool that was known in that area, particularly a, a rare black wool that people wanted. And the medical school was also a source of commerce because they would sell this eye salve that was said to cure any manner of eye, oil, uh, eye diseases. So looking at the letter, start with that description. The faithful and the true witness from chapter 1. Also, the beginning of creation. Now, that's not phrased specifically that way in chapter 1, but it's a reference to something said in chapter 1 when he's said to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning from the end. Okay? So why does he say, I am the beginning of creation and the end, as well as the faithful and true witness? Where does that fit in? Well, we're going to see when we get to the end of the letter why that's the reference he gives to this church. He says, like he does to the other letters, he says, I know your deeds, and then he says that you are neither hot nor cold. Now, in the earlier letters, remember what he said. He has been concerned about things like the number of deeds, the quality of the deeds, uh, because how those deeds went reflect on him. They are a testimony of him. That's been his concern. But notice this time what his concern is when he talks about their deeds. He doesn't say, I know your deeds, and they are neither hot nor cold. He says, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. He is concerned for how their deeds reflect on them this time. What these deeds are saying about them, not what they're saying about Jesus. Notice in verse 15, he says, you are neither hot nor cold, though I wish you were one or the other. Instead, they sit right between those two conditions in a lukewarm state. And he says, as a result, I'm going to spit you out. The, the word for spit in Greek is more literally translated vomit. It's a very strong word, not a gentle word. And when you hear all of that, the choice of words, hot, cold, I wish you were one or the other, you hear all that, it's a little puzzling, right? First of all, we're not sure what hot and cold mean. Uh, and, and as you try to guess what they mean, it's, it gets harder because he says, I, I prefer you were either one, which now makes it harder to understand what could they both be. And so you don't find a solution in the immediate verse, but you do get it if you keep reading. Verse 17, Jesus admonishes them for seeing themselves, he says, as rich and in need of nothing, though he says that was a false view of their situation. So in reality, the church in Laodicea, he says, was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, immediately you know you have to take those words as hyperbola or metaphor, you cannot take them literally. And how do we know that? Well, first of all, we know the church was quite prosperous because the city was quite prosperous. In fact, we know that the believers living in Laodicea were some of the most prosperous of any church in the time. So they're not poor. Uh, even easier. We know that the church there was not universally blind. It was not 100% blind people in the church, right? And they were not 100% walking around naked. So... <laughs> He has to be speaking here in terms that are not literal. He's speaking about uh, not their physical condition, but their spiritual condition. He has to be, because it doesn't make sense any other way. So spiritually speaking, he says, the church is wretched. 
They're spiritually miserable. They're spiritually poor, blind, and naked. Now we have to ask the question then, what does it mean to be those things, spiritually speaking? Well, a quick study of other passages in the Bible will give us only one conclusion from those terms. And one of them you already know, nakedness. What does being naked spiritually mean? It's the opposite of being clothed in white garments. It can only mean that you lack Christ's atoning covering. And similarly, to be poor in the Bible spiritually, or to be wretched or blind, those are all ways of saying a person who does not have faith, who is not saved, as we would say today. Blindness is a, a picture of someone's inability to understand spiritual truth, which is the state of people before they know the Lord. Wretchedness, it refers to the unclean spiritual state of an unbeliever. Poverty refers to the fact that as an believer, unbeliever, you do not share in the riches of Christ, in the inheritance of the kingdom. Right? So, the church of Laodicea, got to wrap our heads around this. The church of Laodicea is condemned by Jesus for a state of unbelief, and yet they're telling themselves they have everything they need. They are wealthy, they say. They are in need of nothing. Now, unlike Jesus, the church isn't speaking in purely spiritual terms. What they're speaking in is literal earthly terms. That is, their earthly, luxurious lifestyle has blinded them to their spiritual lack. They see one as evidence that they have no issue with the other. Or maybe in more modern terms, God must love me, I'm living high on the hog. I mean, they may not have said it that way, unless they're from Texas, but that's, that's the sense of it. So their physical prosperity blinds them to their spiritual poverty. And so they live a self-satisfied, secure life in their earthly wealth, and yet they are in spiritual jeopardy. Now at this point, you should be asking, if you haven't already, how can a church be unbelieving? Isn't that an oxymoron? Isn't that a contradictory statement? Well, the answer comes when you adopt a broader understanding of what church means as a whole, the idea of church, generally speaking. From an earthly perspective, there was an institution in the city of Laodicea called the church, and people met in places around the city. They sang songs, they prayed together, they conducted services, they probably had a potluck once in a while. They called it church. Um, Anyone who had been in the city in those days and observed all of that activity, they would have said, there's the church of Laodicea doing their thing, right? The church. But from a spiritual perspective, the buildings, the gatherings, the groups, wherever they were, they actually consisted of two different kinds of people meeting together as one. There were the believers in those rooms, and we now understand there were also unbelievers meeting in those places with the church. The true believer, as we know from Romans 8, is the one who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit of God is invisible. And so it is not possible for human beings to look one to another and determine who has the Spirit of God in any kind of perfect deterministic sense. We might get somewhat of an idea based on behavior, but even then that's not very accurate because frankly, uh, it's easy for someone to imitate what they see Christians doing and fool the rest of us into thinking they're one of us. I mean, it's not that hard. We're not that different from the rest of the world. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not like we have a secret handshake we don't tell anybody about for years. And it's just, they come to church, they sit in the pew, they go home. What's the difference? If they want to, if that makes them excited, if that pleases them. So what Jesus is saying to this church is that this is a church of unbelief because there was a large, or apparently a large, contingency of unbelievers congregating within that community, making the problem that we're talking about here. And it's such a concern because as unbelievers infiltrate the body of Christ, not literally, not as, not, you know, in other words, they don't become part of the believing element, but as they mix with us, let's say it that way, they have a detrimental effect on the body. The presence of unrecognized unbelief in the body is the single most dangerous problem to the church. You literally have wolves among the sheep. Worse still, wolves in sheep's clothing. We naturally lower our guard when someone says to us that they are Christian like we are. 
And yet, if it turns out that they aren't truly saved, you now have this wolf in sheep's clothing walking amongst us, and in some cases directing others, teaching others, counseling others, stirring up trouble, creating dissent, doing whatever they feel like doing in their flesh, because that's all they have. And for the believers in that situation, there is an inordinate degree of trust and openness to that effect. And they might rise with enough time to the point of influencing the doctrines and the teachings and the activities of the church. And of course, absent the Spirit, what will they promote in general? Ungodliness. That's all they have to offer. Even if they can dress it up on Sunday and make it look pretty acceptable. So for the unbeliever living side by side with believers, you end up with an apostate church. And now you see what Jesus means when he says, I'd rather the church be hot or cold. Hot might suggest a believer. Cold might suggest an unbeliever, the opposite. And what he says is, I'd rather you be hot, believing, that much we understand easily. But also, if not that, I'd rather you be cold, recognizing your unbelief, fully transparently confessing your lack of faith. For at least we know who's who. The alternative, remember he didn't say, I'd rather have you cold than hot. He said, I'd rather you be either one if the only other alternative is lukewarm. The problem is the lukewarm. Because in the lukewarm state, they don't even know what they don't have. It's a complete mystery to everybody. It's better to be cold, an acknowledged unbeliever, than to be lukewarm thinking you're something you're not. These are the people who Jesus speaks about in Matthew 7 who will one day find out too late, Lord, Lord, we saw you in the streets, we ate with you. And he says, away from me, I never knew you. That can happen for those. Now, if you're wondering, well, how do I know if I'm truly saved? The only people who ever worry about whether they're saved are believers. It's a general rule, and I will will bet anyone on that rule, okay? The only people who stay awake at night wondering if they're truly saved are the saved. (laughs) These people are saying, we are rich and in need of nothing. They ain't worried about nothing because they don't realize what they don't have. That's the problem. So Jesus says here, those who are in the church but do not belong to him, he says, those who are lukewarm, I vomit you out. The city of Laodicea was situated in a valley that was fed by two rivers, one that was cold mountain water that was drinkable, one that was hot sulfuric spring water that you couldn't drink. It was poisonous. And where about the time, place in the valley where Laodicea was, they, the two rivers met and mixed and made this poisonous, lukewarm, purposeless, useless water. And it had only one value. The medical school used it as a, what are they, I don't know the medical term, when they make you throw up. Uh, 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 something you drink and it makes you throw up. That's how they use the water. Amen. Yeah, Emmet, that's right. I'll let you say it. And Jesus uses that metaphor because it would have been so, uh, obviously so identifiable to that city. Something that you spit out. Not, now, this is the only one of the seven churches in which there is no commendation. The only church in which not a single good thing is said by Jesus about this church. And his remedy for this church is their heart condition, which is another clue that we know he's concerned about the lack of faith. He says, purchase from me gold refined by fire so that you may come, become rich. That's a spiritual reference to obtain eternal treasure. Buy from me white garments. Clearly a reference to salvation. Now don't get too caught up on the buy thing. It's not to say you're going to purchase your salvation. This is all metaphoric. He's simply making a contrast here, right? That In other words, they are basing their success, wealth, and security on what they've been able to obtain, purchase, so to speak, from the world. And he's simply flipping the script on them and saying, instead of buying all that stuff of the world, why don't you come to me and buy it all from me, so to speak. Have what you don't have because I have the power to give it to you. And he gives them an exhortation. Change and repent, and if you do, he says, then you can dine with me in the kingdom. That is, you will have the salvation that you're lacking. And I love the way he gives them a little, um, I guess, incentive. He says, those I reprove, or I love, I reprove. Hear what he's saying. You'll know if you're mine because your life won't be so easy. That is to say, it's a good thing that this a change that I'm offering you will move you from luxurious and easy life to something a little less so. That's a good thing, because those I love, I reprove, I discipline. It will bring moments of trial, moments of purification, but that's to your benefit. You know, as 
The writer of Hebrews says that if he did not discipline us, we would be as if illegitimate children because parents supposedly discipline their children. That's a sign of love. All right, who is this church? Well, it's pretty obvious where we are in this church, right? We are in the last age. I'll come back to that in a minute. We're in the last period of this age, the times of our, and it's our time. And it should be equally obvious that as an apostate church, we're talking about something quite concerning. We have, whether you see it one way or the other, we either have the privilege of being in the very last moment, which is to say near the end of all this time and new things are about to happen, or we have the, the disadvantage of being there because we happen to be in the worst of the seven churches as far as testimony goes. Apostasy means to fall away, to abandon something that was previously accepted, but not in the sense of an individual here. We're talking about in the sense of a church. The Bible is clear that those who are born again are forever a new creature in Christ, and spiritual rebirth cannot be reversed. So once you have become who you are in Christ, that is your eternal future without change. But the issue here is not what the individual person is doing. The issue here is how the church is changing. And we're talking about a church that changes from Philadelphia to Laodicea. Faithful, no condemnation, serving Christ and evangelism to a church that is mostly unsaved, thinking only about itself and doesn't seem to know the difference. That's a change of a, into apostasy of the entity that we're talking about. And you get that by seeing the individuals within it shift. They shift away from majority believer to majority unbeliever. By majority, I don't mean in every given setting or in every given gathering. I'm talking the church universal, those who would call themselves Christian. Paul talks about this apostasy in the last days. You've probably seen this, 1 Timothy 4.1. When he speaks about this, he says, The Spirit explicitly says that in the later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of hypocrisy, of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has gratefully or created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. There will be a time, Paul says, in which... Teaching of devils, of demons, false teaching, will be promulgated by deceitful spirits who indwell the liars who are seared in their conscience. Fancy way of saying, men and women, unbelievers, indwelled by demons, being taught by those demons, seared in their conscience, lying out the kazoo, sharing that with everyone who wants to hear them, calling themselves men and women of God. That will become a normal state in the last days. Welcome to Laodicea. Secondly, one of the signs of the end of the age and of the apostasy is, among the two that he mentions here, I'm going to highlight one for just the sake of time, abstaining from foods. Now, why is that so significant? It's, it, it's significant because it deals with wealth. It's the key to know that we are in this wealthy state in which the church says, I am rich and in need of nothing. It is a luxury to be picky eaters. Historically, people were not picky eaters. Go back three, four, five hundred years, go back any period in history, you ate what you could find. And you weren't particularly picky about anything that came your way. Now we can eat food of certain colors. We can eat food that only is shaped a certain way. And we can eat you know, only things that appeal to us in certain ways. And I'm not judging people's food choices, but I am saying this, that is a luxury. That is a serious luxury that you have the, the ability to find that kind of variety on demand cheaply whenever you want. And Paul says it's an outcoming of this false lifestyle of the church, of this false teaching, of this self-satisfied, unbeliever-focused church, that we get to the point where people are actually associating the kinds of food you eat with spiritual matters, as if what you eat changes anything about your spirit. Jesus says it goes in here and comes out somewhere else, and it has no effect on the mean in, the, in between. And yet there is this sense in the church that I can become more godly or more pleasing to God or something because of what I eat. Welcome to Laodicea, a luxury of our time. Paul gives us a little more detail, just about the end here, folks. Paul gives us a little more detail about this in 2 Timothy 3.1. He says, in the last days, difficult times will come. You know this passage, right? Hopefully many of you have heard it. And as I read, I won't read one, uh, verses 2 through 5. You can see them. It's a list. And if this is not a list of the days we live in, I don't know what it is. It's a list of everything on YouTube, everything on Twitter, everything on Facebook, everything in the world you see every day. It is the world today. Now, the world has always had these traits to varying degrees. But the difference is, Paul says in the last days, the world will be known for these things. Simply put, 
They're no longer the exception, they become the rule. And looking through the list, it's hard to imagine a world that would live like this, isn't it? Or is it? The last days, the and it's not a coincidence, by the way, that the last days run like this and the church is apostate. It's not a coincidence. Where did the church go wrong? It starts back with the description Jesus gave us. And Paul tells us this in 2 Timothy 4.1. He says to Timothy, he says in verse 2, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And then he says in verse 3, For the time will come when they, the church, will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Jesus opened up this book saying, I am the beginning from the end. I am the true witness. He's referring to two bedrock beliefs of the church that were lost at the beginning of the last century and which set the church on its apostate journey. Those two teachings relate to those two descriptions. When you leave the missionary church to enter into the apostate church, there are two movements that come right at that same time in, in history, at the end of the 19th century. You have the first, the rise of biblical criticism. This is a movement within, it started in Germany, in the seminaries of, of Western Europe, and it became, took hold there and it spread to West, the, all of Western Europe and into the North American continent and beyond. And this is the movement. Biblical criticism uh, says that the Bible can no longer be understood as literal truth, nor is it a work of God alone. It is just the work of imperfect men. It's got lots of errors and different interpretations and some stories and some myth and some parable, and we don't need to take it all so seriously. And Moses didn't write the first five books, and Matthew probably didn't write Matthew, and we don't even know if Paul existed. And that biblical criticism movement came out of academia, a desire to promote and publish new ideas that no one else had thought of, and its effect was to, gen to churn out generation after generation of seminary-taught men who no longer believed the Bible was literally true, would no longer stand for that, would no longer stand on the truth of Scripture, teaching congregations that it was no longer true, and as a result, there was a general and widespread movement away from literal biblical interpretation. And as a result, you have new divisions and disagreements and a sense that unity matters more than truth and a desire within the church to just set aside all those arguments of doctrine and theology anyway. How many churches have you been in where they won't teach the book of Revelation because they're worried about that problem? Friends, people weren't always so confused about Revelation. People weren't always so unable to reconcile their views. That is a more modern outcome. And pulpits have been filled with this kind of progressive thinking. Jesus says to the church that is suffering under the results of this, I am the true faithful witness, meaning the word of God is true. And then lastly, and I apologize for the length, but I hope you'll appreciate that it was worth it tonight, the rise of evolution at the end of the 19th century weakened confidence and reliance on scripture and particularly on the creation account. And Peter promised in 2 Peter 3 that this would happen, that people would turn aside from a belief in the creation account. And that a worldwide, worldwide belief in a fairy tale called evolution, which directly contradicts scripture and denies the need for Christ's atoning death, by the way, for after all, if Adam and his sin did not start death, then I don't need a new Adam to die to correct for that problem. Death precedes sin, then I don't need a man to die to solve the sin problem that I have. They're not related. The Bible says, no, they are related. There was no sin, or there was no death until there was sin, which means that there was no evolution. And it's easier to claim that the Bible is not to be taken literally than it is to fight against the world and its view in this area. And so churches, once again, found reason to retreat from a literal and solid understanding of Scripture for the sake of getting along with the culture that they valued so highly. And never mind the fact that if teaching is not being done properly, people grow up not even aware that there is a difference. So without a beginning that starts with God, then, as you would know, there's really no end to worry about. And if God didn't start everything, I'm not too worried about how it's going to end. And if the book's not really true anyway, I'm not really interested in what it says in the middle. And if I don't know anything about what God's doing, I'm fat, dumb, and happy, and I don't serve him at all. It's a very powerful strategy on part of the enemy. And so in the way that the church age ends, you end up with the apostate church of Laodicea. Where does this church end? Where do the times that are end? They end when the events of chapter 4 begin, after these things. So when we come back, we start studying 
what gets us out of this age, what gets us into the things that happen after these things, and we'll move from there through a whole series of things that take us out of the book of Revelation. All right? I did an extra 15 tonight, which is not what I normally want to do, but there's so much still ahead of us, I don't want us to miss the chance to, to get through it all. All right? So I appreciate your patience. Uh, we'll take 15 minutes for questions when we have a chance here at the end. Let's just pray and be done. Heavenly Father, we thank you for patience tonight among all who are here, understanding if, if we have it, and thank you, Father, that if we don't, that you'll never stop teaching us. Show us how what we learn tonight, Father, can make us a truer witness so that our garments, Father, will be clean and bright before you on the day we see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.